This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. On behalf of the Department of Psychology, it gives me great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce the 20th annual uh, Lanier Lecture, which will be offered this year by Professor Carol Dweck. Uh, before I yield the microphone, I do want to say a few words about Professor Lyle Lanier, in whose honor we uh, hold this lecture series. Lyle Lanier was invited to Illinois in 1950 to head the Department of Psychology after a distinguished career at New York University, Vanderbilt, and Vassar. It was under his leadership that the department recruited the excellent faculty that established here one of the best departments of psychology in the country. It was really his vision that created the atmosphere and the environment that have allowed us to maintain this tradition ever since. Those of us who have lived our professional lives in this department ought to know, and most of us do know who have been here for a while, that it really is to Lyle Lanier that we owe the serious commitment to a very broad concept of psychology that encompasses a very basic research, but with a deep commitment to placing psychology in the public service in any way that it can be helpful. Perhaps even more importantly is that it is Lyle Lanier to whom we owe the civility, uh, respect for our colleagues, uh, expectation of excellence, and collegiality, uh, collegiality, which has kept so many of us here uh, in the cornfields uh, under the threat of uh, tornadoes, ice storms, and uh, budget uncertainties of all kinds. <laughs> In short, although a uh, few of us are old enough to have known Lyle Lanier personally, in another sense, we know him in a very uh, uh, intimate and, and close way because by all accounts, it is to him uh, that we owe much of what we love and respect about our department. Lyle Lanier served as department head for eight years, and then he became dean of the College of LAS and ultimately provost of the university before retiring in 1972. And of course, uh, it would be nice to have him back now given the uh, <laughs> uh, various openings that we have uh, <laughs> at, at the leadership. In a real sense, his breadth and uh, vision and commitment to excellence reached far beyond the Department of Psychology to the college as a whole and to the university as a whole during his time here. So it's in honor of his many contributions that we've organized this lecture series, which provides an occasion uh, for which we can present to our colleagues all across the campus and, and to the community as a whole, uh, the best example of the manner in which a scientific approach to the analysis of the mind and of behavior can yield results which are of significance across the whole range of human concerns. The Lanier Lecture Series is funded by an endowment which was created by Lyle Lanier's children after his death in 1988. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Lyle's uh, daughter, Kathy Lemon, and her husband, L. Jean Lemon, who are here tonight, if you wouldn't mind standing and waving at the crowd. <laughs> I know Kathy's gonna <laughs> yell at me later for doing that, but we're really very grateful for the support of, of Kathy and Jean, as well as uh, Lyle's son, uh, Lyle Lanier Jr., who couldn't be here uh, with us tonight. Well, the, the broad interest in this series and in this evening's lecture are manifested by the long list of sponsors, and uh, I must uh, thank them. They include the Child Development Laboratory, the Clearinghouse on Early Education and Parenting, 
uh, the Family Resilience Center, School of Labor and Employment Relations, School of Social Work, Spurlock Museum, and the Departments of Business Administration, Educational Psychology, Human and Community Development, Kinesiology and Community Health, and Sociology. This gives you an idea of, of how interesting uh, the topic is tonight. And of course, we're also grateful for the generous support of the Center for Advanced Study and the Millercom uh, Lecture Committee. So without further ado, I'll turn the microphone over to my colleague, Professor Eva Pomerantz, who will introduce Professor Carol Dweck, our speaker for this evening. Eva? Well, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Carol Dweck tonight. She's currently the Lewis and Virginia Eaton Professor of Psychology at Stanford University. Carol began her career in psychology as a graduate student at Yale University, where she was involved in pioneering, pioneering work focused on how to alleviate helplessness, that is the tendency to give up when faced with challenge. Carol's first position after graduate school was here at the University of Illinois as an assistant professor, where she went through the ranks to full professor. She did do a brief four-year stint at Harvard, but she came back here for that Midwestern lifestyle. <laughs> Before she moved to Columbia University in her hometown of New York City. It was here at the University of Illinois that Carol began her groundbreaking work on mindsets, which you will hear about in just a few minutes. This initial work focused on the striking differences among children and how they responded to challenge, with some responding with helplessness and others responding with a mastery orientation. That is, that they remained positively engaged even when they were encountering difficulty. Over the last 20 years, Carol has focused on understanding why this is the case. As she will tell you tonight, key are mindsets about intelligence as something that is malleable rather than as a static entity that cannot be changed. This idea has not only been rigorously tested by Carol and her students using experimental as well as correlational methods, but also in more recent years has been applied in the field through interventions. Carol's ideas have been adopted by countless others within and outside of the field of psychology for understanding a range of phenomena beyond motivation. Indeed, while the sheer quantity of our 100 empirical and conceptual articles in some of our field's premier journals is impressive, what I find more impressive about her published work is the impact of that work. It's heavily cited by scholars and frequently covered in the mainstream media. Carol's effort to tackle socially important problems in the most scientifically rigorous fashion sets a standard for which many of us aspire. It's thus not surprising that she's won a number of prestigious awards, just to mention two, the Donald Campbell Award for Contributions to Social and Personality Psychology and the American Psychological Association Award for Contributions to Educational Psychology. Lest you think Carol has achieved so, so much at some interpersonal cost, let me also add that she's a fabulous person as well. Many appreciate her support, her company, and her charm. So it is a real privilege to have Carol here to share her research with us tonight. Um, and please join me in welcoming her. to honor the legacy of Lyle Lanier. I'd like to start with a quote from an eminent and wise political scientist, Benjamin Barber. He said, I don't divide the world into the weak and the strong or the successes and the failures. I divide the world into the learners and non-learners. Why would anyone become a non-learner we're born with the most exuberant, irrepressible desire to learn. You never see an unmotivated <laughs> baby. <laughs> Instead, we see babies full of curiosity, eagerly um, approaching the most challenging uh, skills of a lifetime. Yet many of the things we do 
to help and motivate our children, make them into non-learners. When we put too much emphasis on being gifted and talented, when we put too much emphasis on test scores or getting into the exact right schools, we create children who feel they have to be infallible. And employers are telling us that we have created a generation of young workers who cannot get through the day without an award. <laughs> so how do we make sure that our children remain learners? My work for many years has inform this topic, and that's what I'd like to share with you this evening. In my work, I found that some students have what I call a fixed mindset. They think their intelligence is just a fixed trait. They have a certain amount, and that's that. And as you'll see, when students believe this, they worry about how much they actually have. And before they take on a challenge, they, they worry. Am I going to look smart when they hit obstacles? They think, am I going to look dumb? And this curtails their learning over the long run. But when students have a, a growth <coughs> mindset, they believe that their intelligence is malleable. It's a potential that can be developed through their effort, dedication, through instruction. Now, they don't believe everybody's necessarily the same or that anyone can be Einstein. But they understand that even Einstein wasn't Einstein before he put in years and years and years of dedicated practice. So in the growth mindset, talent is a starting point. It's not the end all and be all. I'm often asked which mindset is correct. And what's so exciting is that more and more research from cognitive psychology and neuroscience is showing that the fundamental components of intelligence can now be taught. Once we understand what they are, they can be trained, and not just in kids, but in adults as well. Does a person hold the main, a same mindset in different life arenas? Not necessarily. Someone can think their athletic skills can be developed, but their in intellect is, is static. Or even within intelligence, they can think math, whoa, that's fixed. But uh, language skills can be developed, or vice versa. Whatever they believe in a particular domain will affect their motivation in that domain. Can mindsets be changed? Yes. And I'll talk about that later, but I think it's such an exciting and important thing about human personality and behavior. It can be really stable when left to itself, but when we really understand something like a mindset, we can go in and tweak it, and we can then see all the ramifications. How do mindsets work? They work by creating an entire psychological world for the individual where everything has a different meaning. And I'm going to explain the mindsets in terms of the mindset rules. Rule number one, in a fixed mindset, it's look smart at all times and at all costs. Because if it's fixed, you better have it. Whereas in a growth mindset, where the whole idea is developing your intelligence, the cardinal rule is learn, learn, learn. I'm going to be illustrating this um, rule number one by um, talking about a study we did with several hundred students making the transition to seventh grade. Transitions are difficult, especially that one. Um, where the work gets harder, the grading gets more stringent, the environment gets less, less personal, and it's a time when a lot of students turn off to school. We wanted to see whether mindsets played a role in that. And so we measured their mindset at the beginning of seventh grade to see whether they thought intelligence was fixed or something that could be cultivated. We measured a lot of other things, and then we monitored their grades over the next two years, especially in math, because that's where a lot of students get off the academic train. And what, the first thing we found was 
look smart versus learning. The students with a fixed mindset said, the main thing I want when I do my schoolwork is to show how good I am at it. But the students with a growth mindset, well, they cared about grades, but they cared even more about learning. They said it's much more important for me to learn things in my classes than it is to get the best grades. Now, these two groups of students, those with the fixed and the growth mindset, they entered seventh grade with identical math achievement test scores. But by the end of their first semester of seventh grade, their math grades had jumped apart substantially and continued to diverge over the next two years. We found the same thing with pre-med students at Columbia University. Now, nobody cares about grades more than pre-med students. <laughs> They've lived their lives for this moment, their first organic chemistry course. Their parents have lived their lives for this moment. And yet, the students with the growth mindset said they cared first and foremost about learning. And because of that, they ended up earning higher grades in that course, controlling for their entering abilities. Now, how did they do this? Because their goal was to learn, they studied more deeply to understand the material. They managed their time more efficiently. They managed their motivation, making sure that they were interested and motivated in chemistry. They didn't just think, oh, if I'm brilliant, I'll do well, and if I'm not, I won't. They understood that it was a learning process that they were in charge of, and it worked for them. More than any study we've ever done, this study shows how a fixed mindset turns you away from learning and a growth mindset turns you toward learning. In this study, we brought students one at a time into the brainwave lab. We outfitted them with a cap full of electrodes. We were particularly interested in <laughs> measuring from the part of the brain that um, reflected attention. That meant they were, for those of you who are not brain-wise, this is a joke. <laughs> um, we, uh, the uh, part of the brain that told us they were entering a state of intense attention. They were harnessing their attention to receive information. After they were outfitted with the cap of electrodes, they sat at the computer the computer asked them a series of difficult questions, one at a time, a whole long series of questions, like what's the capital of Australia, Canberra, who was the Union general at the Battle of Gettysburg, Meade, and so forth. A second and a half later, the computer told them whether their answer was right or wrong, and a second and a half later, the computer told them what the right answer really was. And the question was, so when did they harness their attention? When did they enter a state of vigilance? When we looked at the students who had a fixed mindset, they entered a very strong state of vigilance to find out whether they were right or wrong. And that was that. Their job was over. But when we looked at the students who had endorsed a growth mindset, Yes, they entered a state of vigilance here because it's part of learning to know whether your answer is right or wrong. But they entered another very strong state of vigilance to find out what the right answer really was. And they did this even when their answer had been correct. They were interested in elaborating upon their knowledge and shoring it up. Well, being psychologists, we didn't stop there. We gave them a surprise retest on the items they got wrong. And now we found that the students who had a growth mindset scored significantly higher. They corrected many more of their answers because they were interested in learning. And if you extrapolate that to life, you have one group going around the world saying, did I get it right? Am I smart? And the other group saying, tell me what I don't know. Tell me what I need to learn. Which brings us to rule number two. In a fixed mindset, effort is a negative thing. 
they believe if you really have ability, things should come naturally. And that if you have to work hard at it, well, then you just don't have ability. They say, to tell the truth, when I work hard at my schoolwork, it makes me feel like I'm not very smart. They agree with Homer Simpson, Simpson who says, trying is the first step toward failure. <laughs> Whereas um, students in a growth mindset feel that working hard is what ignites their ability, allows them to use it to the fullest, and allows their ability to grow over time. So for them, effort is key. They say the harder you work at something, the better you'll be at it. So who's right? Do geniuses work hard, or does it just come naturally? Some of the most exciting work in psychology by Anders Ericsson and his colleagues is showing that there is one thing that separates people who make great creative contributions from their equally talented peers. Uh, or their once equally talented peers. And that is the tremendous deliberate effort, the deliberate practice they devote to their work over long periods of time, where they dedicate themselves not just to shoring up their strengths, but also to systematically addressing their weaknesses. So it looks like the growth mindset people here have the right idea and the fixed mindset idea that if you're smart, you shouldn't need ability, I think is one of the worst beliefs anyone can have. Everything in life requires effort, even struggle at some point. Um, everything that we value, if we think back, has taken a lot of effort. Um, and if that effort feels undermining, to your confidence and your competence, you're at a great disadvantage. I believe, and we're studying this, I believe that this is why a lot of very bright students stop working in school at some point. They've coasted along. Everyone's told them how brilliant they are for not having to work hard and still getting the A's. And at some point, it becomes difficult. They don't know what to do. Should they work hard and feel um, dumb, or should they retire while everyone still thinks they're brilliant? And many of them make the latter choice. The parents will say, but you're so smart, you're so smart, if only you worked hard. But that's the whole reason they retired. They didn't want to work hard and reveal deficiencies. Rule number three. In the face of setbacks, in a fixed mindset, it's hide your mistakes, conceal your deficiencies, because they're permanent. Whereas in a growth mindset, it's capitalize on your mistakes, confront your deficiencies, and take steps to remedy them. In a fixed mindset, the reason the, um, one wants to conceal deficiencies is because, as I mentioned, it takes on this particular meaning of being permanent. OK. Uh, in our transition to junior high study, those in the fixed mindset said, I'd spend, after, oh, after a disappointing, don't look ahead, after a disappointing grade on a first exam in a course, they said, I would spend less time on this subject from now on. I would try not to take this subject ever again. It's the first exam in a new course, and I would try to cheat on the next test. <laughs> well, think about it. If a failure means you lack ability and you don't see it effort as effective or desirable, what are the choices left for you? Whereas in a growth mindset, they said, I'd work harder in this class from now on. I'd spend more time studying for the test. Over and over, in years and years of research now, we've seen that a fixed mindset gives students no good recipe for recovering from setbacks. They give up and retreat to their comfort zone. They blame others. Or they find someone who did worse than they did to feel superior to. But none of these, none of these make them a learner. All of these strategies are for non-learners. 
Where do mindsets come from? We've studied this in a large number of ways, but probably the most interesting way is through the praise that adults give to children. Our language, our praise towards children, tells them what we believe and what we value in them. And maybe the most important thing I've learned from all of my research is how exquisitely tuned in children are to what adults value. We're social beings. We absorb that like sponges. Now, I undertook this research on praise at the height of the self-esteem movement. This is the, um, the needlepoint mantra of the self-esteem <laughs> movement. <laughs> and they were telling everybody, parents, teachers, employers, whatever, praise as lavishly and as broadly as you can. This will build children's confidence and their motivation. And before we undertook this research, we did a survey of parents. 85% of them said you must praise your children's intelligence for them to have confidence in themselves. But we said, wait a minute, we've been studying um, vulnerability and resilience for years now. And it's the vulnerable children who are overly focused on their intelligence, worried about how smart they are. And maybe praising intelligence would have that effect. It would put them into a fixed mindset. It might tell them, I can look at your performance and know something about that intelligence deep down inside of you. Maybe it's also telling them, that's what I value in you. Well, the great thing about research is you can form these hypotheses and put them to the test. So we did. Um, in this set of studies, these were with uh, young adolescent students. We've done it with kids as young as four and a half, with Andre Simpion here. Um, but I'll tell you about the studies with these um, 10, 11 year olds, um, because they illustrate the phenomenon, I think, best. By the way, the results we got were so striking, we did the study over five more times, and we just kept getting the same results. In these studies, we brought children in one at a time to a room in their school. We gave them a set of 10 problems from this nonverbal IQ test. You fill in the matrix going across and down with the one from the bottom that correctly completes it. After. They completed the 10 problems, and they did pretty well. They were, um, each child was given one form of praise. A third of them were given intelligence praise. Wow, that's a really good score. You must be smart at this. One third were given effort praise. It didn't have to be effort. Anything about the process they engaged in, their strategy, their effort, their perseverance in the face of obstacles. Wow, that's a really good score. You must have tried really hard. And a third group um, was the control group. Wow, that's a really good score. And I won't talk much about them. They tended to be in the middle. What happened? The first thing was, yes, indeed, the intelligence praise put kids into a fixed mindset, thinking, oh, it's fixed and I have it for the moment. Um, uh, compared to the effort praise that put them into more of a growth mindset. The next thing we found was that the intelligence praise made children into non-learners. When we gave them a choice of tasks to work on next, ones they were sure to do well at, or ones that stretched them, they might make mistakes, but they would learn, the majority of children praised for intelligence chose the task where they could keep on looking smart and they wouldn't make mistakes. Whereas the overwhelming majority of the students praised for effort chose the difficult task that they could learn from. Later on in the session, we gave everybody a difficult task to work on. And what we found was that very soon into the difficult task, the confidence and the enjoyment of the children praised for intelligence 
evaporated because they thought, if success means I'm smart, what does failure mean? They concluded they weren't smart at this after all. They didn't enjoy it any longer. How can you enjoy something that's telling you every moment you're not smart? Whereas the students praised for effort, remained engaged, remained confident, and continue to enjoy the task, many of them said the hard problems were their favorites. We then gave students a third set of problems, matched in difficulty to the first set. And look what happened. The students who were praised for their effort showed a steep increase in their performance on this IQ test from trial one to trial three, because they had remained engaged and confident, taught themselves uh, new and better strategies. But the students who were praised for their intelligence showed a decline in their performance on this IQ test, because having the fixed mindset made the struggle undermining. But again, being psychologists, we didn't stop there. We told the students, you know, we're going to do this research in another school. And we bet the students in the other school would be really interested in your experience here. We gave them a sheet of paper. We said, don't put your name on it. Uh, just write about your experience. And then we let, left a little space for them to report their scores. And what we found was that almost 40% of the students who had been praised for intelligence lied. <laughs> and only in one direction. <laughs> um, very few, 12, 13% of the students in the other th group thought they had to falsely ameliorate their result. What does this mean? These children were randomly assigned to get a certain form of praise. And yet, here are these children feeling that they cannot admit a deficiency. And um, I don't think that's how we want our kids going around the world, thinking that a failure is so humiliating that they can't even admit it anonymously to someone they will never meet. Maybe they couldn't admit it. <laughs> They couldn't admit it even to themselves, perhaps, because in a fixed mindset, your outcomes speak so um, critically to your underlying competence and maybe even your worth. So I thought I'd give a few examples of how you praised yesterday and maybe how you'll praise tomorrow um, after hearing about this work. So yesterday, if your child got an A without working, you might say, look, you got an A without really working. You're really good at math. But now you can hear this message that says, hey, you're really smart at something when, it, when you um, do well without working. Or you did that so quickly and easily. That's impressive. Why is that impressive? They already knew how to do it. Um, so. <laughs> So, and you hear the message. If they're struggling with something, maybe they're going to hide it from you. So what will you do tomorrow? You got an A without working. Well, that's nice, but you must not be learning much. <laughs> and it's not, I made this a little extreme. You don't, obviously don't want to tell your child A's are bad. But, uh, you did that so quickly and easily. Oh, I'm sorry I wasted your time. Let's do something you can learn from. <laughs> As we saw the benefits that the growth mindset conferred on students, we started wondering whether we could teach a growth mindset, and if we did, whether students would actually reap the benefits of the growth mindset. And so in um, the first study we did along these lines, we created two workshops. In the control group, uh, the workshop consisted of eight sessions of terrific and very useful study skills. They liked them. They liked the sessions. They learned the study skills. But would it help their performance? 
I should mention that um, these students were ones who were showing a sharp de decline in their grades, especially in math, over the, uh, over the seventh grade. This was in the second uh, semester of seventh grade. The growth mindset group got eight sessions. S uh, some of them contained study skills, but the rest contained a growth mindset. In the growth mindset session, well, the first one of the growth mindset sessions was kicked off by this article. You can grow your intelligence. New research shows the brain can be developed like a muscle. And uh, the students learned that every time they stretch themselves to learn something hard, to tackle something hard and learn something new, their brains actually formed new connections. And over time, they got smarter. The students were actually galvanized or mesmerized to learn that the growth of their minds was, in a real sense, in their hands. And we will never forget this one boy who was the bane of our existence. He would not sit down to hear our pearls of wisdom, our workshop pearls of wisdom. He was always cutting up with his friends. And when we started going over the Growth Mindset article, he actually shooed his friends away, sat down, and we think with tears in his eyes said, you mean I don't have to be dumb? And that boy caught fire along with many of his peers. And what we found was that the group that got the study skills continued to decline in their grades, whereas those that got the growth mindset and study skills showed a marked rebound in their math grades. We also asked the teachers, did you notice any difference in the students in your class, in their motivation? The teachers didn't know which students were in which workshop, because the workshops looked so similar, they didn't even know there were two different ones. And yet they singled out three times as many students, 27 to 9 percent, of students in the Growth Mindset Workshop. And they wrote extensively about how they had um, changed in their motivation to learn. More recently, we've uh, developed a computer-based Growth Mindset Workshop that we call Brainology. Uh, in order to make this more widely available. And um, in this workshop, um, in Brainology, students are told this is an owner's manual for your brain, uh, which is the most important thing you'll ever have. Um, and they learn that there are many things they can do to make their brains work better. So here they visit a, a state-of-the-art brain lab. They meet the mad brain scientist. They do experiments on the brain. Here they click on the nerve endings to see how neurons make new connections. We tested this in 20 New York City schools. And at the end of that, we asked every student, just using their code name to anonymously report whether they had changed their minds about learning or the way learning takes place. Virtually everyone wrote that they had changed their minds in important ways. But I, I just um, brought a couple of quotes here today. Many of them wrote that this image of neurons forming new connections was very powerfully motivating to them. <clears throat> and here, here's what they said. My favorite thing from brainology is the neurons part, where when you learn something, there are connections and they keep growing. I always picture them when I'm in school. Yes, I imagine neurons making connections in my brain, and I feel like I am learning something. Other students said, every time I think of not studying, I think, no. My brain won't form new connections. So just that image is very powerfully motivating for them. I want to, before ending, tell you about a few very different and new directions in which we've taken this work. And one of them is about confronting prejudice. Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the moment we become silent about things that matter. And he really spoke out against 
prejudice and discrimination. In these studies with Anitha Rattan, we wondered whether a growth mindset would help people be able to speak out against uh, bias. Because if you believe that people can change, then you might take the step to try to educate them. So in these studies, we found, indeed, a growth mindset did predict confronting prejudice directly in order to educate people. Students were confronted with someone who made quite a biased statement. And those with a growth mindset were many times more likely to try to educate the person than just back off. In other studies, we showed not only were they more willing to educate and confront, they were more willing to work with that person and socialize that person, uh, and, and socialize with that person um, in the future. So they left the door open to a, a future relationship. And finally, we show that when you taught people a growth mindset, and let me tell you how we did that, in, in our experiment, people read either a fixed mindset article that said personality is like plaster, it's really hardens and is stable over time, or a growth mindset, personality is changeable and can be developed. Personality characteristics are basically a bundle of possibilities that wait to be developed and cultivated. After that, they were in a situation where they, could, they, they were confronted with a biased statement. And those who had learned the growth mindset, even though they didn't know these two incidents were connected, um, were significantly more likely to try to educate the individual. And again, were, despite um, the bias statement, were more willing to socialize and work with that person again in the future. In a fixed mindset, they didn't speak up, but they went away and wanted nothing more to do with that person, um, which robs the world of opportunities for education. And in a work setting or a school setting, if you, if you cut people off successively, uh, you're out of the loop. More recently, or just at about the same time, we decided to see whether um, conflict resolution was affected by mindset. So we went to the mother of all conflicts, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Why start small? Why not? I, you know, I love a challenge. <laughs> and um, here, um, in, in the initial studies, we found that hatred, not fear or anger, hatred was what predicted high support for um, this, this among a nationwide sample of um, Israelis, high support for aggression against Palestinians, and low support for compromise. We then did a short-term experiment, again, where we taught a growth mindset briefly um, to a sample of uh, Israelis who were largely hawks. And we found that teaching a growth mindset lowered the hatred that they felt and increased their support for the peace process. How did we teach a, a growth mindset in this case? We talked about pa patterns and violence um, in groups. Um, patterns of violence, we said, are not about ingrained, long-standing, inherent personality characteristics, but were more in um, a function of the leaders that were leading them or the environments of the group. And we gave examples from around the world that when leaders changed or environments changed, so did the ways of the group. And um, when we looked at their support for compromise and the peace process, we found that it wasn't just on trivial items that they changed their views as a result of learning the growth mindset. It was about evacuation of the occupied territories. It was about agreeing that parts of Jerusalem could possibly be the capital of a Palestinian state. And it was openness to peace, peace initiatives that might come from the Palestinians themselves. 
Also, people have begun working in organizational settings to look at how organizational cultures might be changed. Because after all, we want leaders and managers, not like Jeff Skilling, the smartest guy in the room, but more um, uh, people who are open to learning and willing to collaborate. And in a very interesting series of studies, Peter Heslin and his colleagues found that when managers learned a growth mindset, they were more open to feedback from their employees. They were more willing, even eager, to mentor their employees, because if people can change, mentoring becomes relevant. And they were more likely to notice, to tune into improvement in their employees. Uh, recently, I collaborated with a professional uh, Major League Baseball team to devise questions. They were interested in assessing the mindsets of their potential recruits, their draft choices. My brother says, this makes me a success. <laughs> um, to, to uh, all things being equal, they'd rather recruit someone who thought that they had something to learn than someone who um, thought they had uh, just could coast on their natural talent. One of the questions we came up with was, um, when you think about on-field success in the major leagues, what do you think you might have to change? And some potential dra draft choices said, I think I'll have to get used to cheering of larger crowds. <laughs> but others said, everything. I'll have to change everything. It's a whole new ball game at that level. So you could see why um, they might prefer, in addition to cultivating a growth mindset in, in their existing players, you might see why they might choose someone who thought they'd have to learn and grow perpetually to someone who thought their natural talent would simply take them there. And uh, we're embarking now um, on uh, health, because we all know we should eat this instead of this, <laughs> and that we should do that instead of that. <laughs> But we don't actually always succeed. And we're wondering now whether a growth mindset about health will enable people to stick to their health regimes, health diet regimes, more effectively. In a preliminary, uh, preliminary surveys that we've given out in high schools, uh, show that a majority of students believe that they just have a certain amount or level of health and that's that. And they don't understand that their exercise, their diets uh, have an impact. So um, we're really interested, as, as I said, to see whether a growth mindset will encourage the adoption of a rigorous regime and the ability to persist in it over time. So in conclusion, a growth mindset allows people to embrace learning and growth instead of worrying how much intelligence and natural talent they have. It allows them to understand the role of effort in creating intelligence and talent and not see effort as something that talented people shouldn't need. And it allows individuals to maintain confidence and effectiveness when they need it most, that is, in the face of challenges and setbacks. And maybe most important of all, a growth mindset can be taught. So thank you. I'd be delighted to take questions. Are you going to moderate, or should I just? Is this where she said that? Oh, you have that. Okay. Excellent. 
If you have a question, the microphone will migrate to you, and they need, in order for it to be recorded. Yes. Thank you for a very, very interesting lecture. And I was wondering if this growth mindset idea has been applied to maybe elderly people that may have memory deficiencies. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're very interested in collaborating. I'm collaborating with people at the Longevity Center at Stanford to see whether belief that you can exercise and develop your mind is uh, will forestall some of the memory declines that people experience when they're older. So yes, we, I have nothing to tell you at the moment, but it's something we're very, very interested in pursuing. Thank you for the lecture. I have a, a question. Have you um, uh, investigated the growth mindset and uh, in uh, relation to gender, and if so, um, are there things that you could tell us about that? Yes, I can, and I'm so glad you asked that question, because a very important point is that um, our research and other research is finding that if you are laboring under a negative stereotype, as say girls are in math and some sciences, it's particularly important to have a growth mindset. In one of our studies, um, we followed um, females in their calculus course. And we found that the females who had a fixed mindset, when they said they were encountering a lot of stereotyping, lost the sense that they belonged in math. They um, showed significantly less intention to pursue math in the future and their grades started suffering over the course of the semester. But when they had a growth mindset, they didn't like the stereotyping, but they, they didn't feel that that meant they didn't belong there. They still intended to take math, and their grades didn't suffer. So when you think about it, a negative stereotype is a fixed mindset label. It says it's fixed and your group doesn't have it. If you already have a fixed mindset and you find yourself struggling, you think maybe they're right. But if you think it's learned that the skills can be acquired, then you think, well, maybe historically my group didn't do as well, but maybe we weren't encouraged, people didn't believe in us, maybe we didn't believe in ourselves, but the, these are acquired skills and I'm going to acquire them. So you can see um, why it would be particularly important under those circumstances. And again, that's what research from several labs is supporting. So um, thank you for the uh, great lecture. One of the direct outcomes of praising the children is what we see in the public education system where standards of the education are constantly lowered so kids can feel just good about themselves yes. simply because they yes. performed well. So um, I don't know if you have an educational outreach program where the Department of Child and Family mm -hmm. Services can be taught about what you, yes. your findings are because it's I critical see, yes. to the educational policies in the country. I think what you're saying is correct. It's another consequence of the self-esteem movement that parents, many parents, certainly not all parents, but many parents nowadays feel their child should not suffer for a moment. Their child should feel good about themselves and happy at all times. And um, they are not teaching their children to love challenges or um, cope with the difficulty. They feel that they are handing their children self-esteem on a silver platter, which our intelligent phrase research shows that can't be done. What you can do is equip them with the skills to develop and maintain their own self-esteem through love of challenge, persistence in the face of obstacles, appreciation and enjoyment of effort. So that's just key, and that's I'm doing my best to get the word out there.